Hello, friends. Welcome back to our Dream Big Nation podcast. As you know, we are bringing stories of inspiration and pivots during this crazy, crazy COVID time right now. Today, we're bringing a story of a new friend to our listeners, Mr. Stefan Leary. Welcome, Stefan, to our show. Hello, hello. How are you? I am doing great. Um, let me, I'm just going to brag about you a little bit to our <laughs> listeners. <Okay. laughs> you know, um, I had the pleasure of meeting him through a mutual connection, um, Mr. Michael Butler and Daniel Gomez, um, both, both amazing men of faith. And I, I just love the connections that they've made in my life. Um, Stefan is a former college basketball player who spent 11 years as an athletic director and teacher and counselor, um, pivoted. He was a, a coach at Liberty University and has also run a number of programs for youth as well and is now a best-selling author. And I'm really excited to dig into your new book, but the one that he's most known for now is They Call Me Coach and it and really does have his own blind blindside story that movie that a lot of us know about so stefan i'm going to ask you first to play a little game with me okay All right, let's do it okay so do i have your permission to uh get a little little vulnerable hey i'm all i'm open let's do it okay okay so i'm going to share something with you that maybe I wouldn't necessarily want everyone to know. And then I'm going to ask you to do the same. Okay. Let's do it. So, so today I'm going to tell you what's true for me today. Um, today I woke up and I had um, three things that I was behind on and an inbox that hadn't been addressed in about 24 hours because of yesterday's schedule. And I'm feeling a little whelmed right now. I don't want to say overwhelmed, but I'm, I'm going to say whelmed. Um, and I, so that is my truth today that on the outside, I would like to everyone to imagine I've got everything together, <laughs> but I don't. And I think it's a, it's a common misconception of entrepreneurs um, that there's a life work balance because I, I don't agree with that in the slightest. So, so tell us what would be something that maybe you wouldn't necessarily want everyone to know about right now? Um, I would say that I'm probably a big crybaby right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just went over to my, uh, my parents' house who I consider to be my, my uh, sounding boards and my rock. And um, I, I, yesterday I had my own experience similar to yours. Um, being someone who on the outside, many people have thought has accomplished a lot of things in my life through playing basketball, coaching basketball, being an inventor, author, all of that stuff. People say all of those things, but they don't know that Coach Larry, Stefan Larry has insecurities and, um, you know, times in his life where he feels insignificant, insignificant as well. So yesterday I had a moment, <laughs> but the moment turned out to be such a blessing because yesterday I finished writing my, my uh, second book. And in finishing it, I got this spirit of heaviness on me, like questioning myself, like, is this going to be any good? Is it going to be worth it? Is it? <laughs> I had this feeling, you, you know, I was thinking to myself, do you have enough words? I'm not, are you really done? All of that stuff was consuming me. And I thought, I need to just go sit before God, which is typically what I do in those moments. And in that moment, I heard a worship song that came on, The Blessing. Mm -hmm. And I plugged my little, you know, disc in and I just pray mm -hmm. worship for a little minute cry mm -hmm. <laughs> and I opened my eyes and I looked at this uh this manuscript that I had written and something just came over me for one it was more words than my first book <laughs> and I'm like wow that happened right 
And then the second thing was I started reading some of it and I thought, who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> You're that's like, that's me. good. I love yeah, it. Who I is said, that guy? <laughs> wow, that's good. Who wrote that? I love so it. in my most vulnerable time where I felt like a little big baby, um, God smiled on me. So yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing that and being Absolutely. vulnerable. You know, um, one thing that I love about you, Stefan, is your message to inspire others that the the maybe their best life is still ahead. Absolutely. And that persevering through challenges. I think it's such a such a good theme to talk about right now in the midst of this COVID crisis. Um, I mean, you really were forced to pivot and tell, tell our listeners about that. And, you know, maybe some of the mud you had to get through to, to push through and um, what's been revealed on the other side, you know, in terms of joy that you've received. Absolutely. So um, the pandemic hits in uh, March. Mind you, I have a basketball and training uh, organization in which I offer select teams to teams in the area, kids in the area. And I was just about to have my greatest year yet, right? Can I tell you something? I want to I want to pause for a minute because I have heard this like so many people were poised. 2020, the year of vision, the year of perfect yeah. vision and all this. And remind us, where, where are you in the country, by the I'm way? I'm in Houston, Texas. You're in Houston. Okay, sorry to interrupt. I just had Houston. to comment there. So um, I'm embarking on my biggest year yet. Uh, my program is probably one of the largest in the, in the state. Um, and we've been very successful over the years. And many people have heard about it and wanted to be a part of it. And so I was coming out of a situation from 2019 where I was, I was scammed at the end of it and went through something that I was like, oh my gosh, what's happening to me? <laughs> 2020 hits and I'm like, my best year yet, right? And yeah. so while I'm thinking this is going to be one of my best years, the pandemic hit. And it hit me in two ways, being an entrepreneur, that, I'm that I was focused on. Number one was my basketball program in which I had 17 teams signed up to compete. The highest I've ever had was 14. And the second aspect of it is I have a training and rehabilitation boot that I, was, I had invented. And I was having it made over in China. <laughs> and so not only did my business shut down, my product was shut down in China. And so I found myself in a place where I'm thinking, okay, what are you going to do with yourself? And during these times where I feel like for me, Stefan Leary, I'm always um, reminded of the call on my life. Because the one thing that I've never done is doubt God's call on my life, nor have I doubted him no matter how times have gotten. Because the way that my life, the way that I, my life came to be what it is, it was undoubtedly God, had to be a God. Mm -hmm. uh, at a five o'clock in the morning meeting, prayer meeting, me being a black kid, a white woman walks up to me and offers me a place to live. That is a God moment. Yeah. And that's so it, I always remember God is still in control, but I also was mindful of the fact that I was just coming out of something and I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? Yeah. So that was my income. The shoe was something that I was working on and excited about possibly launching last year. And so those two things, when they, when the COVID situation hit, I found myself still trying to train, stay active. And one day I hurt my foot. And when I hurt my foot, I could not train anymore. And so I found myself sitting in my house all alone, twiddling my thumbs, what am I gonna do? And in that moment, it was like God spoke to me, finish the book. Mm -hmm. 
And I had a friend who came to visit. And this friend that came to visit, she, she uh, saw my vision board. And on my vision board, I have finished the book. And when I went to the restroom and she was about to leave, she wrote all over my vision board, which you probably shouldn't do, but a friend of friend, right? <laughs> she wrote all over it. And she wrote by the book, this should have already been done. <laughs> yeah. People who need to hear your story. And I thought, wow, I better get busy on this thing. Mm -hmm. And then the confirmation was when George Floyd situation happened around Memorial Day, my adopted brother, who's white, and I, he has two sons, they're, they're my nephews. He sends me a text one early morning and I woke up. And he said, hey, your nephew's a little bit confused about what's going on. Would you be willing to come over and have dinner and spend some time and answer some questions for him? Yeah. Tears started to go down my face. And I thought, it's time. It's time. So I sat down, I took a pivot, and I shifted into all-out writing mode. I sat around injured, and it took me about four to six weeks. And I finished, I wrote the first book that I have. They call me. Now, now let me ask you, when I, I've interviewed other authors, they tell me that often they, when they're writing their story, they, they start from the end to the, and, and then go backwards. Is that, is that, was that your process? Interesting enough, I've had this question asked a few times now. And I actually, someone picked up on my journey, my story, and they said to me, uh, Coach, what made you start from the beginning with your book? Hmm. And I said, because here's the interesting part about my journey, right? Um, I had lived my life being an adopted Black young man into a white home, white suburban area, at the age of 17. And I was 51 years old. I had, I came to realize I had lived my life from 17 to 51. And that's all that people knew about me. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And no one knew my story about how I got to 17. Mm -hmm. And so I started from the beginning because I needed to tell people that I was a kid who was raised by a single mom who ran in the middle of the night from an abusive dad, an abusive husband, and left Louisiana with no direction, no purpose, no anything, no place to live. And I end up in Houston, Texas, in the wow. inner city. Wow. So a single mom who runs from an abusive dad and grow up in the inner city of Houston, Texas with seven kids in a two bedroom apartment was where my journey began. Yeah, that's that's gotta be, like a big why for you, your mom? Uh, it was until when I, when I um, came to that place where I became a Christian. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was how almost- old, How old were you then? I was 17. It was all, all my, I had this life changing moment that happened at the age of 17, 1986. And I don't wanna make it sound like we were so old, uh, but, long time ago a coach found me in a gym competing against some of the best players he thought I was pretty good but I was a little rough around the edges probably not the nice guy that most people know I was really competitive and that's because when you grew up in the inner city you it's all about competition it's all about surviving you, can't you, need, well, you need to be right Yes, or, or you got to fight for your right, right? You get beat up until you fight back. And all of those things were something that I had to endure. And so this coach who noticed me asked me to go to a basketball camp. Little did I know that basketball camp was Pistol Peak Maravich, who was a Hall of Fame basketball player. And I tell people I didn't know because I grew up in the hood where you had the TV, where you got aluminum foil and put it around the antenna so that you can get a signal. Uh, that's how it was, by the way, in Alaska, where I grew up. <laughs> there you go. Right? There you go. So 
I, I didn't see, I didn't know who he was. And so that's Pistol Pete in my background. Okay. <laughs> um, I go to this camp and I dominate the camp. And Pistol Pete thinks I'm a really good player myself, <laughs> himself. And he invites me to lunch on the very last day. And so, of course, I'm popping the collar. You know, I'm the best kid here, right? Yeah. Only to get to this lunch where he sits me down and he tells me, Stefan, you're a great basketball player. And you remind me of the late Hall of Fame player, Tiny Archibald. Wow. And he said, you got a chance to be a professional player. But I invited you to lunch to tell you something else. That's, you're, although you're the best player here, I'm not going to give you the MVP award. Mm -hmm. And he said these words to me that changed my life. Your character doesn't fit. Oh, wow. Career. I heard those words, and in that moment, I was furious. I was angry. I pushed the table away, I pushed my tray away, and I caught myself running home, but the camp was in Clearwater, Florida, and I lived in Houston, Texas. I couldn't go much further. So now, I ran to the curb. When he said that, did you know immediately what he meant? No, I was angry, I was mad, I was confused. I ran to, I ran, called myself running off campus and just got to a curb and sat on the curb, and I was crying. Mm -hmm. And the coach that brought me there, named, his name was Dave Stallman. Dave Stallman came up to me, sat down by me. He said, hey, Pete told me what he told you. And I know that's probably difficult for you to hear, but that's the reason why I brought you to the camp. I noticed some of the same things when I saw you playing. And I think it's going to hold you back from being as successful as you would like to be. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage you to come to the closing ceremony, Pistol Pete's gonna share his testimony. I think oh, it will change my life. Oh, I just got I go, this, I go to this ceremony and Pistol Pete Maravich being the first million dollar player in the NBA, the highest scoring in the history of college basketball and Hall of Famer tells of the story of his big mouth and his showboat attitude and his cockiness that nearly got him killed. And in that moment, tears rolled out my face and I felt this is why I came, this is what it was all about. And I, uh, that night, June 18th, 1986, I became a Christian. Wow. It was like the lights came on for me. I began to see things in a different light. In fact, in my new book, my first chapter is, you are more than what you see. I love that. And it's because we are blinded by the things that we see every day that shapes and forms our mentality into believing who we are, why we exist, and, and causes all of the fear and doubt that we, are, we live with from day to day. Yeah. So it was like the, all of that was shedded off me like Jesus who touched the man's blind eyes and the shell fell off. It fell off and I started to see life in a different way that when I returned home to Houston, by this time, you know, a lot of my siblings, I'm the fifth of seven kids. A lot of them had gotten in trouble. They dropped out of school. They been involved in crime and drugs and, and, and different things, alcohol and I was, um, I was trying to be a professional athlete. And so I played sports and I tell people sports saved my life. Mm -hmm. But when I got back, I tell people with the blinders coming off, you really then begin to see sin for sin and you begin to see destruction and choices that you make that will destroy your life for what it really is. When you're living in it and going through it, you just try to survive it and stay away from it, right? Yeah, absolutely. But when I, gained, when I went back, I really saw it for what it was. And I, it was the first time in my life that I said I wanted something better for myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's so many. And you went on to, pay, to play collegiate f basketball. 
correct. That right there is a whole nother le level of um, really intensity being an athlete and a student at the same time. And, you know, I, I see so many athletes that they have this dream and then, then it's crushed because we know how few actually make it yes. professionally. Yes. You know, what would you say to those, those students and those, and even just in general, people that have a dream, yes. you know, that, that it's, it, they don't make it. And yet yes. there's so many other things that yes. they're, they could be doing. You know, this is my, this is a God anointed time for us to be speaking. Yeah. Lisa, I, I cannot believe you asked that question. Do you realize in my book, my second book that I'm releasing, I have a chapter in there called Dreams Versus Purpose. Mm. And here's what I'm doing in this book, in this chapter of this book. I am challenging the thought that we tell people to dream. Mm -hmm. And the, really, the reason why I say that is because of people like me and many others whose dreams don't come true. Mm -hmm. If only 3% of people make the NBA, I tell people this all the time, doesn't that mean that the 97 other percent of people that <laughs> dreamed it didn't make it come true? Right, yeah. So I say to people more often, Dreams don't come true, but there is a God dream in you mm -hmm. of a purpose that he has for you that will always be true. Absolutely. And so I tell people, and it's in this book that I just wrote, that the shattered dreams, the things that you dreamt of and had goals of becoming, simply it's a platform. If you achieve the dream, it's a platform. If you fail to dream, it's a platform. They both are launching places to your purpose. Mm -hmm. Your purpose is greater than the dream. Many people dream something and achieve it. I know a lot of basketball player, professional athletes, having been one myself trying, out, trying to uh, be a professional athlete and didn't make it, but I was an NBA agent as well. And so many of the athletes that leave, three out of four athletes leave the profession broke. Yeah. Back in the same place where they started and now they need to discover the purpose. Mm -hmm. So my challenge is to people, dream your dreams, but man, seek your purpose. Make sure you keep you keep seeking too. I think keep seeking the purpose for why you were created. The yeah. dream is a temporary moment in time, and you may or may not achieve it. But your purpose and who God's called you to be will always be there waiting for you. Yeah. And I use it. I use the story. I don't know about you, but I'm a big Lion King guy. And I use the story about Simba and the Lion King. Yeah. Simba lost sight of who he was. He ran to a place where he didn't know who he was, why he was created. In fact, the two friends feared him more than he knew about himself. They said, he's a lion. <laughs> Let's become friends with him. And yeah. he'll protect us with him. So <laughs> he'll be our bodyguard. <laughs> that is correct. So many people in life lose sight of who they are, why they were created, when their dreams don't come true. And what I want to do is encourage people, there's a greater purpose for why you were created. Mm -hmm. Create a dream, but there's something greater beyond the dream, and that's your purpose and who God's made you to be. When, um, when I was in corporate, I, I've been recruiting for 25 years and I always ask the, you know, people, how did you choose what you're doing? And so many people actually didn't choose. Mm. They accidentally landed in it. Right. And right. 
I mean, yourself, you're you're actually kind of a rare commodity because. No, 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 I'm not rare. I didn't um, choose anything I'm doing. <laughs> well, what I mean, what I mean, now you now you aren't. But when you first got into, you know, you had a mission. You wanted to get into basketball. You were an athlete. You did the and you know you were a trainer and NBA. You know you were living what you really wanted to, and then it was taken from you. A very inadvertent, right. no control of your own. No but think control. about, you know, think about how many people, when they face this, this crisis, they actually weren't doing what they were passionate about. That's right. So, That's right. so like, what would you say to those people? You know, you've, you've had to pivot from something you love to something you were purposely meant to do, in my opinion. So back to this uh, title, you are more than what you see. You see, what happened to all of us, Lisa, is our surroundings, our environments, our culture, the things we listen to, the things we see, the things that we, positions we find ourselves in begin to shape what we think and believe of ourselves. But we are so much more than what we know about ourselves, and sometimes that changes a, a change of scenery a change of environment, a change of surrounding. I'd say you're more than what you see because Stefan Leary, growing up in the inner city, only wanted to be what every other kid in the city wants to be, a professional athlete or an entertainer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And unless you lived in a home where you had parents who went to school, who told you about education and getting a college degree or going to college and being a a lawyer or a doctor or whatever, or unless you're in a school where they have career day and they bring in all of these different people from different careers and you see that there is something greater than yourself than what you see, until you see those things, you allow for those, uh, the, thing, the areas, the environment, the cultures that we live in to shape who we are. So mm -hmm. for those people who have yet to understand what, what their purpose is, what they're created for. The first thing that I would say is you got to know that God created you. You got to know your creator. You have to know from the beginning where it all started, where it all began. And in the beginning, God created. Yeah. You were part of that creation. And in his creating you, he created you in the same image of him. So you look pretty good regardless of what you think when you wake up that day and see the mirror and you don't think of yourself as good. Remember that you are good, not because of what others think, but because your creator thinks you're good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I say to people that, you know, you are, you're more than what you see because remember, I love the Lion King, right? When, when Rafiki told um, Simba, to look for his father in the water, the first thing he said was what? It's just my reflection. My reflection. So many people are living life off of the glance of their reflection. Mm -hmm. And I love what Rafiki says. And in my Rafiki voice, he says, look hard. People who are struggling with finding themselves need to look hard harder. There mm -hmm. is more to them than what they know and what they see. God has a greater plan and purpose for their life. I say that there are seeds of greatness inside of you, but those seeds will lay dormant until you water them, nurture them, and grow them into what it is that God wants you to be. Look harder. Mm -hmm. Change your scenery. Change your scenery. For me, I went from the inner city to the suburbs. My GPA in the inner city, just getting by. Yeah. Pass, no play. Gotcha. That's all I need to do is pass. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I come to the suburbs. You need to get the highest GPA you can if you want to get that college scholarship. Yeah. It was the first time someone told me that. I'd never heard it before. I made a 4.0 my senior year. I love it. Well, and let's talk about that for a minute, because you said something, you said a couple of things. 
when you think about our education system right now, um, like imagine if they had a class on what's your purpose? Yes, yes. Or, or how about financial literacy? Yes. How money works? I mean, there's so many, so many fundamental, just core things that we yes. could be implementing in our schools. Um, you know, what, like what kind of class would you implement if you could? Simple life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, being a teacher, I was a teacher for 10 years. And I taught Bible, I taught math, I taught history. And what I would always tell my kids, the correlation, the parallelism, even in coaching basketball, I would tell them there's the game of life. There's a game of basketball. They both have rules. You can't double dribble in basketball, right? You can't double do things, do things wrong in life. You live by a surrounding boundary <laughs> in yeah. basketball or you step out of bounds. Yeah. You step out of bounds in life. <laughs> you, you know what? You're gonna miss shots in the game of basketball. You're going to miss out on things in life. Yeah. <laughs> to me, the greatest difference between education from what we knew from back in the old days, they were teaching them how to live life. Mm -hmm. And now we're teaching them how to pass tests. How to pass tests and how to be very average. Yes. Yes. And yeah. so they leave school guess what? Not prepared for life. Mm -hmm. To me, it's the saddest thing about our education system is that so many young people having the opportunity to have my own organization, I get so many kids that, that come from school to my gym and they're discouraged about the, you know, test that's coming up, the star test, we call it here in Texas, or you can't go to college in Texas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like so the focus is pass the test get your data on the test I would have probably have not gotten the opportunity I would have gotten if you would have told me it's pass test pass test right yeah you definitely wouldn't have did you end up getting a scholarship oh absolutely yeah 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 I was recruited uh pretty high you know Texas A&M Arkansas Baylor yeah I chose Liberty because of Pistol Pete Maravich he told me there's more to life. Absolutely. He said, if I had to do it all over again, I would go to a place where they would teach me how to live my life the way God desires for me than to play basketball. I love it. Right unseen, I went to Liberty. Yeah. It was a Christian university who could teach me how to be the man of God that I've come to be. My son is going to, uh, my oldest is at Grand Canyon University. Oh yeah, Arizona. Oh, they have a great program there. Absolutely. Um, but you said something interesting because you, um, I mean, I think you're right. We can, we can set ourselves up for success in so many ways, but setting ourselves up in an environment that's going okay. to foster that faith journey. Yes. Um, it's so important. Um, you know, and I, you and I, I feel like we could talk forever, Stefan. I, I want to shift a little bit to race, okay. race relations. Yes. And I, I have, so I was like the whole time you've been talking, I've been thinking to myself, I need to connect you with someone okay. that I would love for you to meet. Um, and then, you know, what's crazy in my head as this white privileged woman the hmm. second thought to my head was that? he's going to just think um, because they're two black athletes that, that I think they should connect. <laughs> I mean, but like, uh, that's, like, are, that's just probably, like thinking in there. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we call that, uh, we call that ants on the brain. Right, it's, exactly. It's negative thoughts. Right. <laughs> you so, got ants on the brain. Like the reason, the reason I want to connect you is like, Everett, it's a gentleman named Jay Nolan who used to pay, play for the San Diego Padres. And he's uh -huh. 
he's also an author and he's uh, passionate about youth and, you know, but like, why is that? Like, why did I have, in your opinion, that like second guess in myself? Like, why would I not connect to you no matter what color you are? Do you know what I'm saying? Well, because society says that when you connect athlete with athlete is because the black athletes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're allowing again what I just said, what society shapes the way we it's like the society construct that we have. So, but here's what I feel. I, I'm glad you asked that question though, because here's what I feel and what you're saying, Lisa. And because I have a white family and I have a white mom that I look at that I love so much, so dearly, she means everything to me. She kisses me every time she sees me and hugs my neck like like she loves. <laughs> loves herself. I do that to my sons. It drives my them mom crazy. Is, she's amazing. <laughs> she's amazing. But here's what I feel for you and what you were saying. You're being prejudged because of what society is doing. And what I really hate for you, for my mom, and for other people is to not be able to or have the freedom to just be you. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You don't have to subject yourself to society standards of what they think about race relations. Mm -hmm. For me, I, I, um, I'm a man that, even though I was adopted into a white family, I played sports. So in playing sports, your teammate is always your teammate. He's your brother, he's your friend, he's everything. Sports taught me even before I was adopted that it didn't matter about the color of the skin. We were trying to win together. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't get mad at the white guy because we didn't win. I got mad at the team because we didn't win. Right. And society has put these standards on us and how we judge and treat one another. That is so important, absolutely so important that you set yourself free from the standards of this of society as it re relates to race mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is this there is an expert that asked jesus who is my neighbor jesus says love the lord your god with all your heart soul might and strength and love your neighbor as yourself and this man says well who is my neighbor and I find that ironic. This is another chapter in my book coming up. It's going to be a really good book. It's going to be a really good book. And what I find that's very interesting is that Jesus, when he told the story about the Good Samaritan, he described everyone, right, except for the person that helped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He said a Levite passed by. He said a priest passed by. He said every specific origin or religions background that the person had, except for the Samaritan. Mm -hmm. And I think that's critical for us to think about because he's saying, who cares who it is? Right. <laughs> it's, he's he's right. my neighbor in need and I'm gonna show him love. Yeah. And I think that is the strongest case for love for all of us to remember. It doesn't matter. Right. It yeah. doesn't matter. And we've got to break the chains that are holding all of us captive from feeling like we are putting each other in bondage when we think of a black person in sports or a black person uh, in, in any stereotype or generic situation. We got to release and free each other to be able to live and love one another again, mm -hmm. again. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This has been so fun. So yes. fun. Yes. I've enjoyed our conversation. Awesome. I feel like you and I are destined to, to do something together. I don't know what. I'm, I'm all in. I mean, yeah. I, I'm what actually thinking of, work. I'm thinking of someone. Are you, are you single by the way? <laughs> uh, well, maybe I should have put that as my secret and tell people, huh? <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I, no, I, I just there's a there's a there's someone that I just think you would I'm so, a enjoy, guy. I'm so enjoy, guy. enjoy each other. I'm just gonna have to brew on it a little bit. <laughs> and she just happens to be in Dallas, by the way. I know that you were a matchmaker, right? <laughs> I am a matchmaker. You know that's what I do for a living, Stefan. <laughs> I'm a business matchmaker. I help I people find their purpose-driven business. <laughs> There you go. There you go. But um, well, we this has been fun. I'm gonna ask you one more question. Yes. Absolutely. And this is going to be kind of our wrap up here. So yes. you you have such a brilliant story. There's so many ways that you're gonna to touch lives and already have. Now we're going through the the craziest pandemic ever. The reality is though, this will happen again, likely, maybe not exactly this, but there's no doubt something else will happen. This will be written about in history books for yeah. certain. So you have young people in your life. You, you don't have children yourself, correct? Don't have them. You have nieces and nephews, it sounds like. And, you know, picture yourself 50 years from now, you're sitting on your porch in a rocking chair and your, maybe your grand nieces and nephews come up and, and they're like, Uncle Stefan, I just learned about the, the COVID in school. I heard people went crazy. <laughs> what did you do? What are you gonna tell them? COVID helped me define and rediscover Stefan Larry. I love it. And I, I like I like this man. <laughs> I'm that very... the, that's as simple as it gets for me. Mm -hmm. I my identify my identity was 27 years of coaching. And I went from a guy who wanted to be a professional basketball player who had three knee surgeries, forced to a life of coaching. I tell people that I never thought once in my life about being a coach. I say coaching chose me. I didn't choose coaching. Yeah. It was something I walked into. But what happened to me was with COVID, it was time to say goodbye to what I had known for 27 years. Yeah, yeah. And so I had to rediscover who I am and who I was made to be. And guess what? I discovered I am more than what I saw myself as. I love that. I became an author, an inventor. I've become things that I never, ever would have known or even imagined thanks to COVID. Absolutely. Praise God. What a great way to end our conversation. Thank you, my friend. That was Thank that you was so fun. much. Such a Absolutely. pleasure. I've so enjoyed talking to you. Yes. Um, to our Dream Big Nation listeners, I'm so blessed to be part of your day and your week. And I hope that our stories of people hiring themselves are really, you know, bringing you to life into your greater purpose. As always, bless you in this amazing life journey. And I can't wait to see you soon. Bye, Stefan. Thank you. God bless you.